What pleased me most about a Greek Orthodox Mass I once attended was that there seemed to be no prescribed behaviour for the congregation. Some stood, some knelt, some sat, some walked. One crawled about the floor like a caterpillar. And the beauty of it was that nobody took the slightest notice of what anyone else was doing. I wish we Anglicans would follow their example. This is Pints with Jack, Season 5, Episode 32, Ecumenism Month, Eastern Orthodox Lewis, After Hours with Dr. Edith M. Humphrey. Good morning, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast where three friends, Andrew, David, and Matt, break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we've been talking about love, and we worked our way through Lewis's book, The Four Loves. But today, we're beginning Ecumenism Month, speaking to people who love C.S. Lewis from a diverse range of religious backgrounds. And as you might have guessed from the opening quotation from Letters to Malcolm, we're kicking things off today by speaking to an Eastern Orthodox Christian, Dr. Edith M. Humphrey. Dr. Humphrey is the William F. Orr Professor Emerita of New Testament at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and a member of St. Nicholas Parish in Pittsburgh. She earned her doctorate from McGill University, Montreal, for which she received the Governor General's Gold Medal, and lectured at several Canadian universities before taking her position in Pittsburgh. Dr. Humphrey has been married to her husband, Chris, for 46 years. She is a mother of three and a grandmother of 21 children, with the latest due in July. She is the author of numerous articles and nine books on topics diverse as apocalypses, worship, Christian spirituality, human sexuality, and C.S. Lewis. Her most recent piece, Beyond the White Fence, is a novel for middle school children in which six young people travel in time and space to meet the saints for whom they are named. Currently, she is completing a book entitled Mediation and the Immediate God, which is to be published in 2022. Since her retirement in January 2021, she has continued to teach in various milieu, write and speak frequently in Christian and academic contexts. And she's here today to talk to us about C.S. Lewis from an Eastern Orthodox perspective, which she discusses in her 2018 book, Further Up and Further In, Orthodox Conversations with C.S. Lewis on Scripture and Theology. Dr. Humphrey, welcome to Pints with Jack. Thank you so much, David, for including me in this discussion in honor of one of my favorite people of all time, C.S. Lewis. (laughs) You're very welcome. Now, as listeners to the show will know, I recently moved to La Crosse, Wisconsin. But when I lived in San Diego, my wife and I attended a Byzantine Catholic church. And it was a parishioner of that parish who first alerted me to your book. He says, you love Eastern theology, you love C.S. Lewis, I think I've just found the perfect book for you. And he wasn't wrong. <laughs> and so I'm I'm really pleased to be kicking off this month-long series of interviews with C.S. Lewis lovers uh, with you today. Well, it's, it's really great to be here. And, you know, when you talk about there being um, people who love Lewis from diverse religious backgrounds, although I hate the word diversity because it's become a, become a kind of a religion today, that really is me in a nutshell. I was nurtured in the Salvation Army. I was the fourth generation in my family to belong to the Army. And then I was confirmed in my 30s as an Anglican in Canada. And I spent a short t- amount of time in a non-denominational church that my husband pastored. And then we went back to Anglican. Uh, with some relief and ended up in the U.S. where I taught at a Presbyterian seminary. And then finally, I moved after 13 long years of discernment into the Orthodox Church. So, uh, you know, that's quite a journey. Yeah. And, and I've, and I've, of course, got friends all across the denominational spectrum and have done retreats and uh, that kind of thing more formally. So um, I, I really do feel that, um, you know, folks are all my brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. And Lewis can be a, 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 co- a common friend for us all. Exactly. Well, let's uh, let, let's let's do a toast. Uh, I am drinking because I'm in a great fast at the moment, so I'm having tea, but with oat milk, so it looks like mud. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you have anything to hand? So I have my morning coffee actually, and in honor of Jack Lewis, I'm using my mug that came from my Ulster Irish grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Well, cheers. Cheers. So can we begin by you sharing with us a little bit about your own faith journey? You gave us a whistle-stop tour. (laughs) Uh, Would you mind just filling that out a little bit? Yeah, I mean, that was just in terms of uh, membership. So I've told you a little bit about that, where I came from and where I ended up. But I haven't given some of the details as to why. And for those who are interested in all the details, if you ever would be interested, you might like to look up a little book called I Still Believe, uh, which has uh, the testimony of 
quite a few um, biblical scholars. I'm the only Orthodox there. Most of them are Protestant. But um, I would say I believed in Jesus ever since I can remember. And um, a personal relationship with Christ was something that was stressed in my earliest formation in the Salvation Army, as well as love and care for all of God's people. So I like to say that the Army is a good place to have come from, gave me training and discipline, and it instilled in me a yearning for God. But for me, the problem, and this grew, but it was something that I sensed very young, was the strong experiential focus of the meetings or the services, kind of a an inducement to take your spiritual temperature every service, and also the lack of sacraments as I started to read the Bible and realized that these were actually commanded by Christ. I, I just couldn't square that with the uh, tradition of, of the army. So um, I, I love the army very much, but I did have some difficulty with those two major areas. As a young adult, I was strongly influenced by Alexandra Johnson, who was an English prof at the University of Toronto, and she was Presbyterian. And I came while I was there, too, to also yearn for a more liturgical worship that actually took me out of myself and didn't, um, and didn't direct my gaze continually inward. While I was at university, I had to learn to fight for my faith in an increasingly hostile world where Christianity was mocked. And there I met my husband who became a Christian, and we both eventually became officers in the Salvation Army, naively hoping that the Army might change, especially in the area of the sacraments. Um, while we were in training, we were because we had um, we had degrees, we were allowed to go and to take a course, a couple of courses down at University of Toronto, and there we met Oliver O'Donovan, and uh, he encouraged us to continue in our, um, in our uh, academic training. He is a very, very well-known academic, um, Anglican academic. And then we later met Bishop Tom Wright, one of his best friends, when we were sent to Montreal by the Army. Eventually, we did leave officership to pursue, to pursue academia, um, and then we did become Anglicans at that time. And there we learned something about God-centered worship. The army had focused me upon Jesus, but the Anglican Church helped me to start to understand the importance of worship. After my graduation, there was kind of a, a from um, the PhD, there was a kind of a detour into a non-denominational church uh, that was a wake-up call for us. My husband was a pastor there, and I helped out, and there were all kinds of problems, both theological and um, in terms of effectivity. And so it made it us ask the question, what is the church? Can a group just be created from scratch? And we did go back to the Anglican Church, but at this time we met Orthodox friends and were being increasingly drawn into Orthodoxy, especially through Father Maxim Lissak of Ottawa, who seemed to me to be a very shiny, if I can use that term, person. And all this time we were very involved in the Anglican renewal and the resistance movement, trying to pull Anglicanism back to its roots and away from the revisionist theology and ethics that seems to have beset it. Um, about 20 years ago, we moved to Pittsburgh, and there I taught at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, um, a um, Presbyterian-founded uh, organization, but ecumenical. And I met many wonderful colleagues and students there, but had to hold on to the essentials of the faith uh, in this kind of um, soup of doctrine. And that was quite a thing to do when you're actually instructing to make room for people, but to be able to actually profess what one actually believes in one's, um, in one's career. Um, things like the atonement, uh, the question of sexual ethics, even the language of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at PTS, all of these are up for grabs. So much of my time was spent in teaching, yes, but also in writing that had a kind of an apologetic tinge. I was dissatisfied, though, with my spiritual life. I yearned for something more. I wanted that shininess, that radiance that I perceived in some Orthodox. But there were some Orthodox teachings that I just couldn't accept. So getting close to the end here, I had a kind of a revelation in February 2008 after I had spent several years with many wonderful Anglicans in the renewal movement. And I realized two things. First of all, the renewal movement had to seem to me a little bit incoherent. It was made up of people with different views on what I considered to be serious matters, like the Eucharist. They gathered around some important issues, but there were others that they really disagreed with quite uh, strongly. And then the second thing that happened was that the problem that I had had with Holy Mary, that problem that was preventing me from becoming Orthodox, finally evaporated. And it happened this way. 
about 13 years ago last month during what is called the Feast of the Presentation. Uh, that's when Jesus was presented to Simeon in the temple. The Lord answered my questions concerning the role of the Theotokos, the God-bearer, Mary. And so I did start to make preparations to be chrismated and to be received into the historic Orthodox Church. And it happened quite in an interesting way, I think. I'd been working um, as I was writing my book, Grand Entrance, on the vision of Isaiah 6, where there's a lot of paradox. There, the coal of fire is both mediated to the prophet, carried by the tongs of the angel, and it's applied immediately to his lips. So I was walking around the house and I was musing on this. I flipped open the February edition of The Word. That's an Orthodox magazine that my husband was editing. He had become Orthodox already. And I saw this hymn, Christ the coal of fire whom holy Isaiah foresaw, now rests in the arms of the Theotokos Mary as in a pair of tongs, and he is given to the elder Simeon. And all of a sudden my eyes were open. The role of holy Mary, which had worried me in encountering orthodoxy, was not to block the way to Christ, nor to obscure him, to stand in the way, but to be like tongs, presenting him to me as she did to Simeon was blessed by the divine presence. For Simeon, it meant that he could depart in peace. But for me, it meant that I could enter the Orthodox Church in peace because my eyes had seen God's salvation and finally understood the role of the saints in it. They enhanced rather than detracted from the sight of the mighty God-man. So Pentecost 2009 marked my entrance into the historic church after I had spent 13 years trying to decide about orthodoxy, and I have now been orthodox for 13 years. And it must have been a nice completion when you first received the Eucharist in the Orthodox Church, because it quotes Isaiah, Behold, this has touched your lips and cleansed you of your sin. Exactly. And actually, the spoon that is used to give the um, a faithful uh, the, the body and the blood is called the tongs. Some people don't know that. Mm. Oh, I didn't know that. Absolutely. Ah. My wife is actually reading Isaiah in her quiet time. We have a small child, so I don't know when that is. But uh, <laughs> she's reading Isaiah uh, by herself this, this Lent. And uh, she came to me the other day and says, oh, my goodness, this is the bit where we receive communion. So I think that's wonderful. Indeed. Well, where in all of that did you first encounter C.S. Lewis? And what role has he played in your formation? Really young. Um, when I turned five in the fall of kindergarten, and within four months, I had mononucleosis. <laughs> I fell asleep during nap time, and the teacher insisted that my mom take me to the doctor, and, and I had mono, which is really unusual for a five-year-old. So I was in bed for months or around the house for months, very tired. And my mom read to me Lewis, and finally, by the end of that year, I was reading Lewis myself. I wrote a letter. Um, a few years afterwards, in 1964, to please, to beg Lewis to please write some more. And to my great dismay, I wish I'd kept it now, um, I got a letter back from Walter Hooper, um, his, the, the man who manages, uh, manages all his work. And um, he told me that many people in North America hadn't realized that C.S. Lewis had passed away on the same day that J.F. Kennedy was, was shot. And so, you know, uh, Kennedy had been in so, in so much in the news that we hadn't noticed this. So there would be no more books forthcoming from him. So pretty soon my, my dad said I could probably manage the um, Cosmic Trilogy. And so I started with that. And I read his adult books when I was very, very young and too young to really understand, 13, 14, 15. <laughs> so it's been really fun Oof. as an adult to read them again and to be able to teach them. Yeah, he he made me um, a Christian in my imagination, I think, before I understood much of the creed. I intuited from his books the importance of the atonement, and the importance of loyalty during hard times, the splendor, the beauty of the world, the presence of things that I couldn't see that were more real than I was, the importance of worship, all, always the presence of God the Creator and of Christ coming again. I saw that through all his books. And I think, too, he's formed me as a scholar. I really do want to be able to reach people, both with logic and with the heart, not just talking to my colleagues in academia. I want to 
yes, be myself and be um, consistent with what I've been taught and what I've received. But I want to point beyond myself to something or someone more important than anyone else. And I think he's a, a fabulous mentor for that. So Lewis has a, a distinct voice of his own. Um, and yet, when you are reading him, you do encounter a person, but he points you beyond himself to the subject matter, to what it is that he's talking about, and then even beyond that, to the God who has inspired that. And that's what I would like to do. Um, uh, he also gave me the aspiration to write children's books, uh, though that comes too from my 20 grandchildren, almost 21. His stress on the importance of myth in writing, and the art of poesis, how the story takes us out of ourselves, that's been very influential in my writing. And some parts of my kid's novel, my first, and I want to write some more, have been, I realize now, in retrospect, unconsciously modeled on parts of his. So I'm afraid probably the final vision uh, was uh, unconsciously modeled upon uh, the uh, creation story of Magician's Nephew, and more consciously, his actually breaking the frame and talking to the reader and suggesting books. I do that too. Also, I've Really, by him, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not naturally uh, a com comedian. But his desire for humor, the the importance that we see um, that we're not the most important thing in the world, and not to take ourselves so seriously. I've really tried to uh, to to bring this into my book and just to relax and have some fun with them. So uh, he's been he's been influential in many many ways. Hmm. Do you have any particular favorites among his works? Oh, that's so hard. Mm. Hands down, though, Till We Have Faces. I don't think there's anything like it. And that was his own favorite of the children's <laughs> book. Oh, yes. We have yeah. battles between the co-hosts as to which is the best. And my co-host, Andrew, will love you for giving that answer. Oh, it has to be. It, it's, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's the kind of book that every time I read it, I see something new. It's, it will be a classic. It will, it will last for centuries, I think. In the children's books, I think The Silver Chair and The Last Battle are, are for me, the most interesting. And, and the most, I can't read the last five pages of The Last Battle out loud without crying. So my, my grandkids <laughs> know. They want to get Grandma to cry and get her to read The Last Battle. Um, in the Cosmic mm -hmm. Trilogy, I love Paralandra. And I think The Great Divorce is has some fantastic moments. I prefer a book that actually you get caught up in. This is more of a kind of a, an allegory or an exercise. Um, it's really an important book, though, extremely important book and very helpful. And just in terms of his discursive work, there's the, the Abolition of Man is, I think, one of the most significant um, uh, series of essays that's been written in the last 200 years. Hmm. Well, let's change gears uh, and talk about Eastern Orthodoxy, because I don't think I had contact with anyone from Eastern Christianity until at least my late 20s. I think my first encounter was when I was living in London. I was waiting for my visa so I could move back to the US. And I was working in London, and at the weekends I was sightseeing. And I would often go and visit different churches. And I think I was admiring the architecture of an Anglican church somewhere one Saturday evening when suddenly the church changed and the Russian Orthodox took it over and I found myself in the middle of the Divine Liturgy. Which I've got to say, I think is one of the best ways to experience orthodoxy. You just you just need to round a corner and suddenly get hit with it. And since we have listeners from across the denominational spectrum, it's quite possible that we could have a lot of listeners who have never actually encountered either the worship or the theology of Eastern Orthodoxy before. So before we start shifting into viewing Lewis through an orthodox lens, uh, would you mind just giving us a brief outline of orthodoxy, any particular distinctives as well? Um, when, say, compared to many other Christian denominations. Sure. So we would say that the Orthodox Church is the Church of the Apostles. Um, mm -hmm. Its teaching and its worship consciously go back, of course, with some development to the earliest Christians who were told in Acts 2 gave themselves to the teaching of the Apostles and the communion of the Apostles, and who also dedicated themselves to the breaking of bread and the prayers over the bread. So it's sacramental. Not just in the sense of stressing the importance of baptism and anointing and Eucharist, but in seeing the whole world as sacramental, as able to 
by, by that, I mean as able to point to the Lord who made it. There's something um, built into everything that God has created that points to him. So readers, our, our listeners can't uh, can't see this, but I'm, I'm going to show you, uh, David, uh, Alexander Schmemans mm-hmm. for the Life of the World and recommend that as, an, as a kind of a description of what we mean by sacramental. Um, historically, there were five ancient patriarchates in, the, in early Christendom. There was Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, Rome, and Constantinople. So eventually Rome became its own church at the time when Constantinople and Rome disagreed regarding the universal jurisdiction of the Roman patriarch, the Pope. Orthodoxies always believed that the leaders should act conciliarly in a council and that one patriarch can't rule the entire church. So this was a long and very sad dispute, but it ended sadly in schism between the East and the West in 1054. And the other four patriarchates remained in communion, though, of course, as we know, especially in the um, in the news today, many um, uh, there are still things that are not perfect. Of course, to the original four C's or areas uh, that remain in orthodoxy, there are newer jur- jurisdictions that are now of now many of them quite ancient. You know, Russia and Bulgaria and Ukraine and Carpathia Rus and Romania. Um, Armenia, Georgia, and there are others. And those who are interested in the history of that can look at Metropolitan Callistos Ware's uh, very helpful book, The mm-hmm. Orthodox Church. And then, of course, there's the Church in America, which has many jurisdictions, alas, because it's it just kind of grew like topsy. People would come over from various nations, and then they would say, hey, we need a priest, and then eventually there would be bishops. And so we have overlapping jurisdictions, which is not the way orthodoxy really is supposed to be. The doctrine and the worship are the same, but the languages are different. Um, at least the foundational languages are different, and very many Orthodox Church now worship in English in America with just little bits and pieces of their um, historical language thrown in. The doctrine and worship remain the same, though, and at our best, we have a deep spiritual unity with each other. We're in communion across jurisdictions. I can go to a Greek church, or I can go to an Antiochian church, and I can take communion there if I make myself known to the uh, uh, to the priest. Although I go to um, uh, a an Orthodox Church of America parish, which originally was Russian, and so what is happening now um, because of our um, our sense of being in union across the jurisdictions. What's happening now with Russia invading Ukraine is a scandal to many of us, and quite frankly, an embarrassment. So distinctives of the faith and practice. I don't think we would really use that kind of language, actually. For us, distinctions are something that Protestants have. And there are, uh, (laughs) we would say, a few Catholic distinctions that we believe have been added to the faith by Rome, such as papal infallibility or the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Son as well as the Father, or Mary's Immaculate Conception. We don't hold to those because we think those are novelties. But if you come into an Orthodox church for the first time or you enter into conversation with Orthodox, here are some things that I think might strike the non-Orthodox Christian in particular. So first of all, we use icons and incense and liturgy and many beautiful things in our worship, believing that when we worship, we're actually caught up into heaven with the angels and the saints. We're not practicing. We're actually there. And we use our bodies a lot in worship. There are processions. We kneel, we stand, we do prostrations, especially during Great Lent. We cross ourselves, especially when the Holy Trinity is mentioned. We lift up our hands occasionally. We move around in worship to light candles. It's not unusual to see a mother take a child up to the iconostasis, up, up on the dais to, uh, to light a candle, as long as it's not going on during a very solemn time. And our liturgies are almost entirely sung. So babies stay through it and they learn to love it. Children don't go out of church to church church school. They take communion from the time they are baptized. And of course, that's if they're in an Orthodox family, that's from infancy. We have worship not just on Sundays, but especially um, in, in special feast times or fasting times during the week. Orthodox Christians have at home a prayer corner as well, where they say daily prayers, often as a family. Well, we love the saints, we love Holy Mary, and we know that our guardian angels help us every day, because Jesus said so. 
uh, were named for a particular saint with whom we have a relationship. And our worship is full of references to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's centered upon Jesus, the God-man. Another thing, too, I think, we believe that the Holy Spirit is available for all believers to bring each of us to a place where we will see and know and actually be like God. So salvation for us is understood not just as a rescue from sin, but as what we call theosis. In short, God became man or human so that man could become, we actually say God, we don't mean the creator, but we mean have a status that is God-like. And ethically, we're pro-life, we're pro-family, and we're pro-care for creation. And material things matter very much to us. I really like that summary. <laughs> uh, I, and I actually wrote a, a couple of blog posts whenever I'd be inviting someone to my Byzantine church. I wrote a, a series called Roman Catholics Say the Darndest Things. And they were the things that people would always say when they came and visited, like, where are the pews? Why is yeah, everybody oh, singing? Yes, yes. <laughs> I forgot. Now, our church does have pews, pews, but every every year one of them goes out. Our, our priest wants to get it. So there are just some for the people that really need to sit around this side because <laughs> there's a lot. It's a lot easier to move around as we want to mm -hmm. when we're worshiping without them. And we stand for most it's of It's definitely uh, a bit weird when you first come anyway, to it, but after you've experienced it and just 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 let go a little bit. It's, it is wonderful. And your comment about uh, worshiping with children is absolutely something that I have also thought. And I again wrote a, a series when I was speaking about Eastern liturgy being the best thing for kids, because it's you walk into a church that is a giant giant you know picture book and because because of the freedom that lewis describes in that letters to malcolm people generally aren't too fussed if you pick up your child and wander to the side and talk them through an icon or go and light a candle it, it, there was there was there was a liberation to eastern worship that i just fell in love with immediately people think because it's liturgical that it's all formal and stuffy and when they first come they think oh what do i do should i stand should i sit what should i do and i basically say look <laughs> just relax make sure you stand if you can i mean if you can't that's fine but be sure you stand during the actual um eucharist when we begin that you know, make sure you stand for the creed. Otherwise, do what you like. Nobody's looking at you. <laughs> yeah, but I, I have yet to see anybody quite roll around like a caterpillar that was I've at met. least older than about five. <laughs> yes, I haven't either. <laughs> <laughs> now, in my experience, the Orthodox and Eastern Christians in general tend to be a little bit suspicious of non-Eastern, non-Orthodox writers. Yet I keep encountering Orthodox Christians who just love Lewis. Would you say that my perception of Eastern Christianity and Orthodoxy is fair? And if so, why is it that Lewis seems to have this privileged status? So, I mean, it depends on who you're talking to. Our priest reads and listens to everybody. And when we have Bible studies, we hear about what contemporary people are saying about Romans, you know, as well as what the fathers have said. So it depends on on who you're talking to. They tend to be more comfortable with Anglican and Roman Catholic commentators. Um, but, you know, Craig Keener is a beloved in our in our congregation, and uh, he's neither. Mm -hmm. He's a he's, uh, very low church. <laughs> so, um, you know, it depends on who it is who's doing the reading and the writing. Uh, we do have the same sense of Lewis, though, that for every contemporary book that you read, you should read two older ones, and, and, and we would say uh, patristic writings. And so the fathers mm -hmm. are very yeah, important. Preferably in Greek. Yeah. <laughs> and there is, there is a suspicion of higher criticism, um, and that's understandable given where some of those directions go. But you know, a, a lot of the a, a lot of the better informed Orthodox priests and scholars read widely, and simply, you know, they spit out the bones and they and they pass on what they find to be helpful. So, um, but they do. You're right; they're not as suspicious of Lewis, and I think he's becoming more and more beloved. 
Father Thomas Hopko, a blessed memory, stressed the importance of Lewis's triad of essays that I mentioned earlier, uh, Abolition of Man. He said that if you want to understand today and the mindset and the worldview of today, you have to read those essays, and they're difficult. If you don't want to read them because you find them too discursive, then probably uh, a, a, a reading through of that hideous strength, the last of the um, of the cosmic uh, trilogy, will, will give you the same thing. Um, uh, there are many things in Lewis's books that bother evangelicals, with which Orthodox are completely ca- uh, comfortable and which we applaud. For example, the idea of progress in virtue and understanding and even conversion after death, as seen in The Great Divorce. We don't have a sen- sense that after death, that's it, you've arrived. We more and more and more and more are brought into the likeness of God. And we will f- warm to his wonderful use of sacramental language to describe God's creation. For example, um, say the scene by the river towards the end of the silver chair where Caspian, the king, is dead in the river and um, Eustace has to drive a thorn into Aslan's, uh, the pad of Aslan's paw and the blood drops in the water and Caspian comes back to life. That's orthodox kind of language. That, That speaks to us very naturally. I do think that he has in many ways what we would call the orthodox phronema, that is the mind of Christ. He doesn't play off the moral, the dogmatic or practical matters. Everything's to the glory of God. And, you know, I guess people will be interested to know that Lewis is so popular that there's a Russian translation of my book further up and further in that is, um, has just been sent to the printer in Ukraine, of course. So there's going to be some delay now before it's actually published. But Russian readers want to understand Lewis. And so um, they thought that my book would be of help to them. Wonderful. <laughs> well, let's talk about your book, Further Up and Further In, Orthodox Conversations with C.S. Lewis on Scripture and Theology. So obviously you are a Lewis fan, but what was it that brought a book into existence? What was what was the motivation here? So, I mean, it was a, it was a course that I gave at the seminary at first. It was just a fun bir- a course, not really a bird course, because it's quite difficult reading, but it's something that I did for a lark, something to take me out of just straight exegesis and so on. And my idea was that I wouldn't lead them through all the books they knew. We did not put on the syllabus, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, or screw tape letters. I I picked the books that I thought were more difficult. Or the books, if the book wasn't difficult, within the book there was a hard teaching of Lewis that I wanted them to come to terms with. And my idea was to try to get the students to see, understand these in particular, but also to see the forest for the trees and to come to delight even in difficult arguments or in, say, that really um, complex piece, um, Pilgrim's Regress, that in which he traces the conversion of um, a kind of an academic type. Uh, to Christianity, um, it was mostly his own um, conversion he was he was tracing there. So I I chose fiction and I chose some key essays and I chose some of his polemical works. And because I was a biblical scholar who loves theology and this had to be a scripture and theology course, I stressed those two um, those two areas. Though we did some on his artistry and so on, I wanted to enter into conversation with Lewis in those areas. But, of course, I was an Orthodox believer. So as I did the analysis, it was always with the view to how, how, how would the church respond to this? How, how do we respond to this in, in the Orthodox community? And I cared about where the points of intersection and difference were. I didn't play that up in the course, but as I realized it would make a good book for Orthodox, who seemed to be discovering Lewis, I sort of fancied myself to be kind of like a reaper cheap. Um, you know, a little scholar urging people further up and further in and, and seeing Lewis as a guide as well. So uh, actually the idea for the book started with the picture of Reap that I had in my imagination and that I haven't been able to find actually anywhere in Pauline Baines's beautiful illustrations of Lewis. So I had my daughter Joelle create for me a picture of Reaper Cheap in Pauline Baines style for the frontispiece of that book. <laughs> well, in the remaining time that we have together, I'd, I'd like to talk through some of the major parts of your book or uh, look at some of the areas where Lewis's articulation of the faith very much reflects the Orthodox perspective or uh, sp- speaks to the Orthodox soul, as well as some of these areas where he might be deemed 
incompatible. Uh, and just just to kick things off, I never connected Lewis with Eastern theology until I'd been going to a Byzantine church for probably at this point six years, something like that. And then I reread Mere Christianity. And in that final section where he's talking about the transformation that takes place, it finally the, the, the penny finally dropped and I suddenly saw theosis. He doesn't use the word, he doesn't use divination, he isn't citing uh, early church fathers, but it was the same principle there, yep. just couched in very different language. And in some ways, that that realization is is sort of at the back of my back of my mind when I when I was thinking about doing this ecumenism course, because one of Lewis's great strengths is he articulates ancient truth, but with new language in an attempt to reach his audience, yes. and he always manages to do it in a way that doesn't seem sectarian, uh, that isn't okay. I'm now going to tell you some Eastern Orthodox theology here. Uh, you Presbyterians need to get on board with this. No, he's trying to express his own perception of the faith. Yeah. Uh, drinking from deep wells from other sources, but to present this truth. And he almost always receives a far more open audience than I think he would otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. In the book that I wrote on Lewis, I kind of even subtly drew attention to the connection with Eastern Orthodoxy by organizing it in terms of three triads, you know, three threes. And that actually is an echo of St. Gregory of Palamas's um, uh, work uh, when he was talking about the importance of spiritual uh, theology and the importance of coming with quietude into God's presence. And so I have three main sections. The first section is called Mapping the Terrain. So we're thinking about going further up and further in. But first of all, we have to map the terrain. And, and that talks about meta issues like writing, like creation, like the writer being engaging in sub-creation and thanksgiving to God um, and his worldview. Um, what he thinks about um, the miraculous, what he thinks about God working in the world, and so on. Um, and then in the second uh, triad, I, I called that traveling in arduous places. And here's the, the hardest part of the book, I think, um, intellectually. Uh, I dealt with uh, thinking carefully and acting, acting ethically. And we talked about the abolition of man and pilgrim's regress there. Uh, we talked about theodicy and spiritual blindness and ascesis. So by theodicy, we mean showing that God is just. You know, this question is, can God really be just if we live in such a terrible world? Um, and that, that, of course, is very clearly seen in Lewis's Till We Have Faces, where the a narrator, um, the one who's writing, actually um, begins by saying, this is, a complaint, this is a complaint against the gods, and here's why. Um, and then the final one, uh, the final section there is blessings and curses. And in that, I talk about justice and the atonement and the idea of the great exchange. And I think in that chapter, which uh, where I also fasten upon till we have faces, but bring it into connection with um, on the incarnation and uh, a chapter of his book, Miracles, um, People will be surprised to find until we have faces not just the sacrificial idea um, that that Christ dies for us that's um, uh, intimated in the story, but also the story that is more often told about our salvation in the East that Christ is the victor. Um, the one who is the conqueror over sin and death, who rescues us when we are enslaved and takes us away from um, uh, the one who would want to be God, who is really only pretending to be the adversary. So you see both, uh, both models um, of atonement uh, intimated or hinted at in his story with uh, one of the uh, young women um, who's a heroine in the story, actually giving her life for her people, and interestingly, as women here, and the other being victorious for her people. Um, and, she, and the one who's victorious for her people, you don't realize she's a heroine really until the end. So that's the second section. And then the third section, it's got some kind of hot button issues. It's plumbing the depths and climbing the height. And in that, I look at depravity and possession the whole business of hell and hell uh, being in, in us, 
Um, the second is uh, Blessings and Curses Revisited, where I con continue to talk about hell and the problem of um, universalism, but I also talk about the glories of heaven. And of course, the great divorce is really important there. And then the final um, chapter of, of that, uh, that third uh, section is sacrament and essence, masculine and feminine. And there I talk about Lewis's way of putting forward human male and figure uh, and male and female figures by showing that they point beyond themselves to realities that we can't imagine and that therefore our gender is important because it is mm, sacramentally, we could use the term, he doesn't linked to bigger realities that we can't see. So those are those are the three sections and some of the things that I do in them. Cool. Well let's let's just pick a couple of them and talk about them. Okay. So 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 shall I talk about the areas where I think that Lewis is compatible? Yeah. Let's Does do that. It, yeah. So he loves the fathers. It's clear that he uses Athanasius. Saint Athanasius, um, why God became man, and he sees Athanasius as um, not simply interesting, but he gives authority to that father and to others when he's um, when he's reading scriptures and when he's thinking deeply about uh, about uh, Christian things. Um, so it's actually from Athanasius that you will see that salvation is not just a rescue, but it leads us to a higher state. That it's not just a check mark. Our um, our being in in the garden and falling and then being restored to the garden but in fact uh, god became man so that we could even come to a higher state that we could if we can put quotation marks around it become gods and that's quite clear in the great divorce but it's also clear at the end of till we have faces and in some of his other pieces as well and athanasius is the first one that sort of articulates that well not the first but he articulates that clearly as do other fathers he also has this kind of sacramental view of reality that um matter matters so say in the lion the witch and the wardrobe they have that wonderful meal that Father Christmas gives to them. And that's part of the story. Or uh, Mrs. Beaver wants to know if she can take her sewing machine with her. Um, you know, um, creature comforts are important to Lewis as long as they are ordered under the other things that are more important. And they have a way of pointing to those other things if they're given that subordinate role. He understands human beings to have a kind of a priestly role, that our role is to give creation back to God in thanksgiving. And he really th sees his own writing as that kind of sub-creative activity. He's not going to save the world by it. It's his offering of gratitude back to God. And he, along with um, talking about um, what it is to be a human being who sub-creates, he stresses the hard work of being a Christian, but alongside God, the initiator who reveals everything. So he holds those side by side and not one dominates over the other. As I mentioned, there's the atonement, not in one picture or perspective, but in many. And that's true even in um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where you have uh, you have Aslan dying on the stone table, but you also have the battle where he's victor over the White Witch. Um, in terms of his anthropology, that is his understanding of what it is to be a human being, he's, he's on a bit of the cutting edge there. He wants to insist that being a man and being a woman corresponds to something greater than ourselves and therefore it's not just kind of window dressing of who we are. And that's something that has not been probed very much. It seems to me that he is a kind of a pioneer here, helping us to see that that's work that the church needs to do. Just like in the day of Arius, the relationship between the human and divine natures of Christ had to be explored. It seems to me that today in our time of debate and confusion and disagreement about gender and what it is to be human, this is one of these things that the church really needs to take seriously and probe into look at the various um, riches, the various things that, that have come to us in the scriptures and the fathers in order to understand that. And I guess finally what I really love is that he doesn't take himself too seriously. You know, his, his work isn't going to save the world. 
is something that he does because he wants to give glory to God and and wants to have fun as well. Yeah. I think you, you're you definitely right about um, the Eastern view of gender. That does need some more development. Whereas in the West, we had Pope St. John Paul II's uh, theology of the body. Uh, and that was very formative for me. And then in my own marriage preparation, we, uh, my wife and I were sent to the fathers to go and read St. John Chrysostom's uh, sermons yep. to, 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 in praise of marriage. And I've often thought that, there, that there's some further synthesis and development that, that, could be, that could be really helpful there. Because Absolutely. we were both formed in theology of the body, so we brought that to uh, St. John Chrysostom and it it really helped. Oh, absolutely. And the thing is, I mean, I guess I wasn't speaking specifically about the East because we think that we do have the resources, but we need to make them more explicit. I was talking to our culture in general. <laughs> that the, uh, there yeah, are people who will not <laughs> read *Humana Vitae*, right? We need we we <laughs> need to be interpreting these um uh these contemporary, very well and carefully thought out things and these ancient patristic um treasures to the world so that it doesn't just look arbi- uh, uh, it doesn't just look arbitrary what we have to say about gender that they understand that it fits into a whole world view and and, and they, they mm-hmm. see it not as a one off rule but as something that corresponds to what it is to be human and i think it's something that that mm-hmm. we need to work on as a church generally east and west is there a particular author, an Eastern author, that you recommend that you think does that well? Because we we read quite a few quite a few books, and I've got to say, some of them were dry as sawdust. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Going back to Saint John was was uh, was uh, red meat and strong beer uh, when we finally got there. <laughs> Yeah, at this point, I would say probably um, St. John Chrysostom is the best that the East has to offer. If you're feeling speculative and adventuresome, then if Dokimov's works, A Woman in the Salvation of the World is one of them, would be interesting, but don't take it all as um, established Orthodox doctrine. He's being speculative there. I actually think that he and Lewis are engaging in something that is not done very carefully and uh, are, are kind of showing the way there. So I suggest uh, both of them in my book. Um, in my book, I try to work out um, some negative boundaries within which we could do this work. You know, we can't say this, we can't say that, we can't say this, we can't say that. I hope that that will be of service to those who are working those things through. There's a new volume that's just come out by the Pro Ecclesia group about um, what it is to be human. And there's another one that's been put out by um, Jordanville Seminary on um, being human, which I think have some interesting essays. But in terms of an actual study, I'm saying go back to Chrysostom. <laughs> mm-hmm. That seems fair. I'll, I'll put links to all of those that I can find in the show notes. Thanks. All right. So we've talked about where there's really good overlap. What, are the, what do you think are some of the uh, points where Lewis goes to a place that an Orthodox Christian say, nah, I can't do that? Some would say his view of atonement because they're thinking of Aslan dying as a substitute and they're thinking of um, Psyche dying as a substitute in the adult book. But I think they're wrong. I think they just haven't noticed the Christus Victor theme. And I, Lewis said mm. when he was talking about atonement, for heaven's sakes, let's not start arguing with each other about which, which, uh, 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 which metaphor or which picture helps us to understand the atonement best because it's, it's mystery and Lewis – uh, Orthodox would agree with that entirely. So I think people um, have set up a, some Orthodox set up a kind of a straw man when they talk about his atonement being too Western. I think they just haven't read him carefully. And I would even say that the that the model that he proposes in mere Christianity of the perfect penitent is very Eastern. Exactly. Because it is all about participation. In Christ. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. So certainly his ecclesiology is Protestant. He has this idea of there being many rooms in a house and that you have to spend your time in the rooms and not too much in the hallways. And that I agree with. You've got to commit yourself. But I think there is this idea that there can be different branches of Christendom. He doesn't use the branch language, but I think that the room in a house is similar. Um, He has the idea that you compare Christianity down to an essence, his whole idea of what is mere Christianity. Now, that's been really helpful because it's made him able to reach many Christians. But 
He also does, in his own writings even, seem to suggest um, that there are things that are important that are not part of this mere Christianity. Um, the difference is more what he doesn't talk about in his formal books than what he does. So he doesn't write about prayer to the saints. He doesn't write about the saints. He doesn't write a lot about the Eucharist, though he insists that this is important in the books that people read. But he talks about the saints in his personal letters. He tells his friends that he prays for those who have gone um, uh, who've gone ahead to Christ. He also practiced personal confession with the priest, but he doesn't tell others to do so. He doesn't broach this in his public work. Now, I, I guess as an Orthodox, I could say this might be like the Orthodox distinction between gospel and household teaching. So if I was talking to somebody about Orthodoxy who never knew anything about it, I would stress the God-man Christ. I wouldn't stress the role of the Theotokos Mary. But we wouldn't distinguish as he seems to between what is personally good for him, like confession to a priest, and what is good for everybody, or prayer that includes praying for those who've died. We would say that's part of being a Christian. So I, I think maybe he's a bit more individualistic than we are then because of that. There's sort of the Protestant bug that's still there. And that makes sense, just where he's come from. Um. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think also that he's made a slight wrong turn in his doctrine of human beings. Um, he's really, because of the tenor of the time, stressing the importance of hierarchy in reality all the way down. That's really important with him. Um, that democracy is good as a um, governing strategy for fallen people, but it does not represent reality. And I understand entirely what he's saying. But in 1 Corinthians 11, we have a kind of a tension there. St. Paul talks about the hierarchy of husband and wife, but he also gives a mutuality that none is independent of the other, right? So, Lewis actually models that in his writing, but when he act, when he talks about reality, he really stresses the hierarchy without always bringing in the mutuality. But his women, he writes them up as heroines in the book. You know, there's um, there's Jane and that hideous drink. She's she's the 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 wise one, not not her, not Mark, her husband. There's till we have faces. Um, with both or Orwell and Psyche modeling um, being actual um, pictures for Christ. There's that stunning picture of Sarah in The Great Divorce, who almost seems like a divinity, and so on. So he writes as though there's mutuality alongside order. And I think maybe just when he talks about First, first Corinthians 11, I think it's in Miracles where he does that, um, he needs maybe to read Paul just a little bit more carefully or nuance his words a little bit more carefully. But he's ta he's talking about some two, two hot-button issues there, what it is to be male and female and what it is to live in a world where everything is not a democracy. And I think I think... That's really important to him, so it may be that he, he, he just pushes that a little bit further than he actually practices in his writings. But it's absolutely the case that he wants to recover for us the idea that it's blessed to serve and not just to rule, and that is very compatible with orthodoxy, where he says, um, we're intended to be adjectives who describe the God, God Almighty, not nouns in our own right. We would say, yes, that's right. And yet God is giving us faces. He's going to make us, if you like to use Lewis's kind of shining nouns that reflect him eventually. I'm not sure whether that's something where he disagrees or something where we agree or something where his um, writing reflects uh, more carefully what it is that he's trying to hold up there that, that um, Orthodox would agree with. Well, I think shining nouns is probably a, a good way to wrap this up. Uh, Dr. Humphrey, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me. 
I hear the final call for drinks at the Eagle and Child. So to wrap things up, where can people go to find out more about you and pick up a copy of your book, Further Up and Further In? Oh, okay. Well, unfortunately, I'm just currently revamping my website, having retired. But you can follow me on my podcast and blog at ancientfaith.com until that website is up. Um, my, My podcast and my blog are called A Lamp for Today. And currently, I'm doing a series on the influence of the Old Testament and the Fathers on the Book of Revelation. But you can also there look at stuff I've done in the past where I've talked about um, Orthodox hymnody and our gospel and epistle readings and so on. So that may be of interest to you. Um, You can get further up and further in at St. Vladimir's Bookstore and also on Amazon. And I'll include links to both in the show notes. Thanks again to Dr. Humphrey for coming on the show. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for our patron supporters helping us do this, particularly our top tier supporters. Amanda, Emmy, Thomas, Deborah, Anonymous, Bill, Joanna, Snort, Bud, Shane, John, Kevin, Brian, Kay, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, Matt, Kelly, Chris, John, James, Kate, Peter, David, and Rowdy. And please check out our website, pintsofjack.com. I keep chipping away at it, adding more resources to help lead you through each of the books and any good lectures and talks that I find, they they will all go up on there somewhere. And please join us next time when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers.